line. Um, he is the most published person dealing with heart and kidneys in the world. He's a heart doctor, kidney doctor, uh, specialist. And, you know, there are some people in this country uh, that see him as controversial. Uh, I'm going to ask him about that. Uh, Dr. Peter McCullough joining us right now on the show. Doctor, I really do appreciate you taking the time to join us, sir. How are you? Thanks for having me. Doctor, when I when I, when you hear that, some people in this country that characterize you as, quote, controversial, do you agree? Do you disagree with that? How does that make you feel? Well, I can tell you in 2019, no one considered me controversial. I had amassed an academic career. I had focused on the interface between heart and kidney disease. I was the named endowed visiting professor at Harvard. I lectured in in multiple divisions there in medicine. I had given grand rounds at the Mayo Clinic, uh, European Medicine Agencies, FDA. Mm -hmm. So no, I was not controversial throughout the course of my career. But when COVID-19 hit, and I proposed that we should treat patients like you early at home so you don't end up in the hospital and nearly mm -hmm. and die, mm -hmm. that became quickly controversial. Mm -hmm. And what my opponent said is that, no, we should not treat people like you. We should let you get very, very sick and then go into the hospital where some would die. That's where things became controversial. So the question on the table is, who really took a reasonable stance here and who didn't? I'm telling you right now, I stand behind what I did is I developed the McCullough Protocol, the most widely used multidrug protocol in the world to treat COVID-19. We went after this. We went on offense and we didn't play defense and we saved lives. Let's go back to the interview you did on the Joe Rogan show, because I believe, you know, that went viral. Were you surprised? And, you know, some of the statements you made, again, when some people use the term uh, controversial on that show, you, you and tell me if you think I'm characterizing this wrong. You made it sound like this was a planned conspiracy with how to treat COVID. Were you surprised at how viral that interview went when you went on the Joe Rogan show? And do you still feel the same way you felt years back? on the Joe Rogan show when you made, made it sound like you believed that it was a planned conspiracy? Well, remember when I went on Joe Rogan, that's pretty late. That's two years into the pandemic. So Joe missed all of 2020 and he missed nearly all of 2021 before he brings me up. I'm the first person he brought on that, you know, was broadly published, was treating at that time, hundreds of patients. Now I've treated thousands of patients. So Joe Rogan's pretty late to the story. And of course, it went viral because his audience is a, a younger audience. Uh, average age is in the 20s. They listen to a three-hour interview, has a transcript. By the way, the most common term in my Joe Rogan interview transcript was monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. That was the most common term, yeah. which is, you know, emergency use authorized uh, products mm -hmm. that were, you know, which were life-saving. Operation Warp Speed. That's the most common term that Joe and I talked about. Sure. But when I talked about the planning of this, uh, you know, I cited documents. This is very important. I gave them to the Spotify producers and I cited documents. One of them, the documents I cited is called the SPARS pandemic. This was a Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health planning seminar and it, in 2017. And they published their proceedings at that time. It was on the Internet. I showed it to Joe. And they said there will be a coronavirus pandemic. That's in 2017. Now they thought it was going to hit 2025, but they said there will be a pandemic. There'll be great controversy around treatment. And we're going to try to organize social media and the federal government and the public health agencies for a mass vaccination campaign. That's in 2017. Then in 2019 hits, now we have event 201. Event 201 is, uh, you know, the, the Chinese CDC director, uh, George Gao, comes over. He's paired up with Avril Haines, our current director of national intelligence. In 2019, they say, well, yeah, for sure there's going to be a coronavirus pandemic. There's mm -hmm. going to be a great confusion regarding treatment. We're going to try to suppress all hope of treatment on social media and, again, organize the entire pandemic response around mass vaccination. Okay, that's in 2019. Now, I testify in the U.S. Senate in November 19th of 2020. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. Now, Ron Johnson's the chair and Gary Peter, and, and, and he's the majority chairman and, and Gary Peters is the minority. Now, I'm the lead witness. And 
and Senator Ron Johnson gives his comments. And then Gary Peters says, before I even have a word come out of my mouth or present my research, Gary Peters says, what you're about to hear is misinformation. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you this. There was a planned, coordinated effort to suppress all hope of early treatment. Why? And well, listen, I wasn't calling the shots. You'd have to ask Gary Peters or Avril Haynes or I uh, asked the people at Johns Hopkins, ask the people who suppressed early treatment. I understand what you're saying, but the, obviously that's an extremely serious claim. You don't know why they would. Usually when somebody, if in fact you're right, there would be a reason for it. Why would they Why would they suppress saving lives? Why, why? Why would this be a coordinated effort? I don't understand. Why? What would be the reason for that? In, in 2012, uh, our research unit of the military, DARPA, put on their website a a uh, a uh, operational scheme. Mm -hmm. It was called the Adept P3 uh, Pandemic Preparedness Planning Program, and it, it has it's still on the website today. Just type it in. Type in the Adept P3 program on mm -hmm. DARPA. It mm -hmm. says they will end pandemics in 60 days using messenger RNA vaccines. That's in 2012. Mm -hmm. So our government was telegraphing to us that they aspired to end pandemics in 60 days using messenger RNA vaccines. And now under the uh, House Select Subcommittee for Coronavirus Investigations, Brad Wenstrup in the House has uncovered email after email where Stefan Bainzel at Moderna is emailing Ralph mm -hmm. Barrick and Anthony Fauci and Peter Daszak. Uh, these are kind of all the co-conspirators in the creation of SARS-CoV-2. And so listen, you know, do you have the code? We're working on the vaccine. Within a few days of Trump announcing the pandemic, Moderna says, we've got a vaccine. Within mm -hmm. a few days. I would so say that's extremely suspicious, but would you claim that Dr. Fauci was one of the co creators of COVID? You, do you believe that? Yeah, yeah, the emails look like he was clearly, uh, you know, his whole division, Nyet, was a major supporter of the research. And so the, the papers that memorialize this are uh, by first author Vineet Menacheri and senior author Ralph Barrick. And the first paper was published in Nature Medicine. This, in 2015, second one in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2016. These again, you just these are easy lookups for you as a journalist. You should have all this in front of you. But these papers say, listen, uh, you know, we have a Wuhan Institute of Virology, SARS-like virus, which is poised for human emergence. And they declared yeah. in those papers that they created a chimeric, a, 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 a fusion of a human coronavirus and a bat coronavirus that can invade human respiratory epithelial cells. In those papers, they've already said, we, we've already tried a vaccine in those papers. Now, in the papers, they say it's gain of function research, but it started before yeah. the federal moratorium. They say that. Yeah. They thank Anthony Fauci's division, the National Allergy Immunology Branch, for their support. Mm -hmm. They thank the Eco Health Alliance and Peter Daszak for coordinating all this. And they thank Dr. Shingling Li yeah. in, in Wuhan, doctor, China. I, I hear what you're saying, doctor. Door. I hear what you're saying, doctor. Uh, just for the record, I'm not a journalist. I'm a talk show host. No more of a journalist than Joe Rogan is. And I think Joe Rogan says a lot of stupid things on his show, quite frankly. But with that being said, I think it's a, uh, it isn't, I want evidence. And, and I know you're saying, well, you should have this in front of you. I want evidence that proves that Dr. Fauci intentionally created a virus to try and kill millions and millions of people. I haven't seen ev any evidence to that or the contrary. And he's been an infectious disease doctor for decades and decades and decades and decades. But let me ask you this. To all the people that have died of COVID, there are still right-wing talk show hosts on the air today. Some of those shows you've done that claim that the vaccines are killing millions of people. I'm not saying you said this, but right-wing talk show hosts, some of them who have died, by the way, who were unvaccinated. Will you agree with me that the vaccinations as a whole for COVID did save a lot of lives and they did a lot more good for people than bad. Well, you know, it would go back to the evidence. So I was giving you the evidence of Anthony's Fauci's involvement mm -hmm. in the creation of SARS-CoV-2. So I gave you the evidence, right? I cited the papers. That's evidence. And I know you're not a journalist, you're a podcaster, but you're being given evidence by a doctor in position of medical authority.
Right. But are you saying that he intentionally created a virus because he wanted millions of people to die? Is he a mass murderer? I'm trying to understand the correlation there. Are you trying to say that he created a virus to kill a bunch of people? Those papers, again, first author, Vineet Menacheri, senior author, mm -hmm. Ralph Barrick. Mm -hmm. Fauci is, uh, is, is funded out of his division. Peter Desick specifically named, Xingling Li specifically named, she's actually an author in one of the papers. The goal of the creation of the virus in those papers, which is the evidence you're asking for, is to invade a human epithelial cell. Why is he been convicted? Why right. isn't he been convicted? Why well, hasn't he been charged with a crime? You know, they, you have been tracking this along that the House Select Committee uh, has continued investigation. Now, Rand Paul is opening one up on the Senate. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, books written by Rand Paul and by uh, Robert F. Kennedy, yeah, which I lay don't... out the fact pattern that he should be convicted. Yeah, but I, I mean, Rand, Rand, but, but Rand Paul know... is an eye doctor and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has zero medical experience. I'm listening to you because you have more experience in your pinky than those two have. I don't care what books Robert F. Kennedy Jr. writes. He's a wannabe politician president and Rand Paul is an eye doctor. I don't want to get my infectious disease uh, uh, information from Rand Paul with all due respect. I want to talk to you. I want to get your opinions. I don't care what Rand Paul has to say. He's a politician and he's been going after Dr. Fauci for years. My question is, okay, investigate. I have no problem with that. I want to see actual evidence that they can prove in a court of law to prosecute Dr. Fauci. And if they can't, I don't want to hear about it. Am I wrong in saying that doctor? Well, what mechanism would you suggest? What mechanism? I want real evidence shown in a court of law that can prove that Dr. Fauci intentionally wanted to create a virus that would kill millions of people. And if they can, they can show that evidence in a courtroom and they can prove it to a jury, then go ahead and send Dr. Fauci to jail. But until that happens, he's, it, it's, been, it's unproven. You can say that there's evidence here and there's evidence there, and I'm listening to you, and I want to get your take on this. That's why I wanted you on the show. But the bottom line here is, doctor, he hasn't been, you know, convicted. He hasn't been prosecuted. He hasn't been indicted. I mean, I mean, those are the facts, right? You're a facts-based guy, right? Those are facts. Well, th then there's obviously mechanisms that you've laid out for that to happen. Sure, sure. And so, you know, I can't render legal opinions. I'm not a lawyer. You're, you're probably not either. Neither, um, no, I'm not either, but I'm a realist. The bottom line is he hasn't been, nothing has been proven in a court of law. And yet everyone, so many people, you're not the only one. So many people keep saying he created this virus. This is on him, the research. And, and I say to myself, show me the real evidence that can be proven in a court of law. But let's switch topics because I want to talk about vaccines with you. Would you agree with me that the vaccines for COVID have done far more good for people in this country than, than not good. There are so many people still that say COVID, the vaccines have killed millions of people, that all these professional athletes are dying of myocarditis when it's just not true. So would you agree with me that the vaccines have done far more good for people than bad? Well, what evidence do you have for that? What evidence do you have that, that all these people are dying of the vaccines? Well, let's just take, uh, let's take safety first, because we always discuss safety before efficacy. Would you agree with that? Sure, sure. Yeah, right. So it doesn't matter how good a product is, it has to be safe. Would you agree with that? Um, I don't think there's any vaccination that's 100% foolproof safe. You know that. Okay, but it would have to have acceptable safety. Would you agree with that? Uh, it depends what your definition of acceptable safety is. We were in a global pandemic where at one point we were losing 5,000 Americans per day. So obviously these were extenuating circumstances, mm -hmm. but go ahead. Mm -hmm. But what would be your definition of acceptable safety? Um, well, uh, I, while I'm not a doctor and you are, I would say in my personal opinion, looking back, um, on half the world being vaccinated, in fact, more than half the world, as you know, at this point, there is no direct evidence that these vaccinations are, people are dropping dead left and right. And as you know, specifically on right-wing media and right-wing talk shows, they claim that all these professional athletes are dying of myocarditis because of the vaccines when they don't even know if these people were vaccinated. They don't know their medical history. And it's frustrating for me, doctor, because I believe the vaccine saved my life. I believe it saved my parents' life. And in so many studies out there, you know, listen, you could, and as you know this, you can get 
COVID if you're vaccinated. It didn't give you a lesser chance of getting infected or giving it to somebody else. However, you are in so many studies that I've seen, and you can tell me if you disagree, far less likely to get the effects of having to go into the ICU or possibly dying if you were vaccinated. Am I wrong? Yeah, you're wrong. And here's the reason why. The prospective randomized double-blind placebo control clinical trials of the vaccines never showed a reduction in severity. They never showed a reduction in hospitalization and death. And what's come out over time is the virus has mutated to become a much milder virus. So as the vaccines were rolling out, you know, we were being confronted with a less mild virus. The mm -hmm. other thing, uh, I mean, a less severe virus, more mild. The other thing that happened is we learned how to treat the illness. Mm -hmm. So we treated patients early and we avoided hospitalization and death. So the two major things that saved people's lives uh, were having natural immunity from the, the first round of infection and then early treatment. What happened with the vaccines, remember the vaccines came in late, you know, so we're, we're already a year in the pandemic. We've been treating people for a year. Mm -hmm. The vaccines come in late. And um, uh, in a, a recent paper by Norman Fenton from the UK, he's shown that there was tremendous misclassification bias. So when they declared that there was a, a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, epidemic of the unvaccinated, uh, in, in fact, the hospitals weren't you know, they had no, they had no idea who was vaccinated or not. They didn't have connection to the CDC vaccine records. Uh, they, they weren't going in the ICU and figuring out people on the ventilator who were vaccinated and who weren't. In countries that actually did have the vaccine status, like the UK, they found far more vaccinated in the hospital on ventilators and dying than the unvaccinated. And in a paper by Shretha and colleagues from the Cleveland Clinic, the least, the lowest risk workers that they have in 51,000 workers are the unvaccinated. And with every single injection, one is more and more likely to get COVID-19. Now, the deaths that have been reported after the vaccine are unprecedented. Our safety system for vaccines records on average, half the country takes vaccines in the United States before COVID, records on average 150 deaths in a year on average. The COVID-19 vaccines roll out. And as we sit here today, our CDC has verified 18,655 Americans dying after the vaccine. 1150 die on the same day they take the shot. Some die in the vaccine center. 1,200 die the next day. Now, that's underreported by a factor in FDA testimony of about 30. We're looking as we sit here today at 550,000 plus Americans have died after the vaccine. So and the you, same, the is same there... pattern is seen worldwide. There are calls to pull these vaccines off the market. They're so grossly unsafe because people die quickly after taking them. And, I'm and telling what... you as a doctor and as a person yeah. of authority, you need to listen, mm -hmm. person of authority, that these okay. vaccines are not safe for human use. They didn't save lives. They've cost people their lives. OK, but here's my question of those five hundred and fifty thousand people that died. Uh, do you have direct evidence that they died from the vaccine? People die after vaccines. It doesn't mean that they died from the vaccine necessarily. Right. Sure. So, we, sure. Right. There's over four hundred peer reviewed manuscripts from VARES where all the vignettes are analyzed. I've published some of them. I've published mm -hmm. the largest autopsy study. Yes, the vast majority are directly caused by the vaccine. These people take the shots. I told you eleven fifty die in the vaccine center or a few hours later. It's the vaccine killing large numbers of people. So what percentage of people that have gotten the vaccine with evidence have died from getting the vaccine? What, what percentage of people are, are, are dying from getting vaccinated? Do you have that information? Well, we have very good data from the CDC vSafe uh, system. Now, mm -hmm. 10 million Americans signed up to report what's going on with the vaccine. What we know there is that, uh, again, the CDC doesn't here want to release the data to you as an American. So they're forced under court order to release it. 7.7% 7 .7 of people take the shot, get so sick that they end up in the ER, uh, urgent care, or are hospitalized. So 7% of people after getting the vaccine end up in the ICU? I don't know one person that has gotten the vaccine that's gone to the ICU. Yeah, I know dozens. I know dozens, probably in my practice, hundreds. How many yeah, people? Okay, so you know, you know dozens. How many people do you know that have been vaccinated? Well, for, listen. 
7.7% from the no, CDC. No, doctor, I get what you're saying, but you're not answering my question. You just said you know dozens of people that have been vaccinated and then have gone to the hospital. How many people do you know that have been vaccinated? I would imagine you know hundreds of thousands probably, or, or at least thousands, right? How well, many people do you know, doctor, that have been vaccinated? You just said you know dozens of people that have gone to the hospital. So my question to you is how many people do you know that have been vaccinated that haven't gone to the hospital? Well, I... I I know a higher percentage of people who were unvaccinated and didn't go to the hospital either. I know, but that wasn't my question. You just said dozens of people went to the hospital after getting vaccinated. I believe you. I believe you, doctor. But I would imagine you know thousands of people that were vaccinated that haven't gone to the hospital. Is that not a fair statement to make? Listen, if it's 7.7%, okay. you, don't you take the me. shot. Listen, you can do the math. You, you, it's, if it's 7.7% of people who go to the urgent care ER or be hospitalized, that's CDC vSafe data. If that's the percentage, you can do the subtraction. That's within yeah, your I capability understand. of doing that. But my point is 7.7% is unacceptably high. Now you're asking how many people have died after the vaccine. It's The estimates are 550,000 plus in the United States. It's mm -hmm. unprecedented. Now with COVID, We've had 1.2 million deaths of people test positive. Our CDC Correct. says about 10% of those would be adjudicated as COVID pneumonia. Yep. So we're looking at 120,000 COVID deaths, 550,000 vaccine deaths. That's not a favorable proposition. Okay, let's go back to Dennis, that. Dennis, Ran Dennis Rancourt worldwide yep. out of Montreal has the worldwide vaccine death number at 17 million. Would you think that's acceptable? Are you telling well, me the vaccines are saving lives? Is that well, what you're saying? Uh, well, me personally, in my personal opinion, yes, sir. I think the vaccines do save lives. Let's go back to the 7.7% .7 that you just mentioned. Is there direct evidence? Now, all you're telling me is that they were vaccinated and they went to the ICU. That doesn't, when I hear that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're in the ICU because of the vaccination. They might have happened to be vaccinated. But how can you correlate that to it must have been because of the vaccine? Where is the evidence of proof that of those 7% or 7.7%, the only reason why they're in the ICU is because they got vaccinated? You know that's not true. Now, remember the CDC vSafe data, and I've said 7.7% take the vaccine, mm -hmm. and within a few hours or a few days get so sick, they go to urgent care, ER, or hospitalized. Now, you're saying ICU. I'm saying urgent care, ER, okay. and hospitalized. Okay. The vignettes have been released. And yeah, it's the vaccine because it happens very quickly. These are known vaccine injury syndromes in the peer-reviewed published literature, thousands of papers. We're talking acute myocarditis and cardiac mm -hmm. arrest, mm -hmm. blood clots, pulmonary embolism, stroke, uh, immunologic problems. Uh, so these are well-characterized vaccine injury syndrome. So yes, the vaccine is the cause. So what would you say the percentage is, I think I asked you this, of those that are vaccinated that die in your estimation because of getting vaccinated directly? What percentage of people, if I have a thousand people that get vaccinated, all sorts of different ages, all sorts of different health, uh, you know, di different types of people at different ages, per thousand people, in your opinion right now, how many people are dying from getting vaccinated? Well, we just, we'll take 550,000 Americans have died. That's catastrophic. That's the civil war casualties and you divide it by everybody who took a vaccine on that, their death certificate. Does it say cause of death uh, vaccinations of those 550,000 people? Well, the autopsies uh, that have been, did, you know, the broadest autopsy study done so far, the number is 73.9% of those who die after a vaccine, the vaccines, the cause of death and of those, the cardiac cases, it's a hundred percent. So yeah. So 73% of those 550,000 people that have died are directly due to COVID or the vaccines. I'm sorry. Is that, is that what I'm getting from you? That's the best application we have. Now, listen, the CDC has all the data. Yeah. They can verify every single case. Now, these are, these are, you know, they can verify every single case they have in the system. They have 18,655. Yeah. Again, it's underreported 30 fold. So if I have a patient who takes the vaccine and they're found dead at home, the paramedics take them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, off to the um, uh, off to the funeral home, and, and we can't get the vaccine card. We can't report it. So uh, again, that's the reason why there's an underreporting factor that's substantial. But you're saying that there's at least four hundred thousand people in this country since the COVID vaccines on their death certificate says cause of death vaccine. Is that what you're claiming? 
No, 550,000. Yeah, and you said 74% or I'm sorry, go right, ahead. Right. So, so 550,000 Americans have died after the COVID-19 vaccine. That's an right. estimate. Okay, right. That's an estimate. Which doesn't mean they died of the vaccine, but go ahead. Okay. But they die in, you know, a, a percentage of them, if we take mm -hmm. the CDC VAERS data, Okay. Uh, it, it's a substantial percentage, uh, 10 or 15% die on the same day they take it. You're right. They could have died in a car accident. Uh, you know, a percentage of them die in the vaccine center. They do CPR and they finally, you know, they stop, they stop resuscitative efforts. No, I understand what you're saying, but I think this right. is a really important question to ask. And that's why I'm asking it to you of this 550,000 people. How many of those people on their death certificate with a doctor that knows their medical history, which obviously we don't, a doctor who knows how old they were, the circumstances surrounding their death, it actually says on the death certificate that they died from the vaccine. That I think this is a really important question. It's an important question, and you're right. The CDC needs to tell us. Okay, so they that's my question, doctor. The CDC hasn't told you, so you're assuming and at least it sounds like to me that you're making a, an assumption that they probably died from the vaccine when you don't even have that information. You don't have it on their death certificate. You're claiming that the CDC might be withholding that information. But don't you think it's a gross assumption to say that they all died from the vaccine because no. they were vaccinated? Be well, we have the largest autopsy study done. I'm the senior author on it, so I'm not assuming that. I'm just How many autopsies were done? How many? About 300. So out of 550,000 people, you did a study of 300 people, and now you're making an assumption that all these 550,000 people might have died from the vaccine when you don't have that information from the CDC, and you find that to be responsible? Sure. Yeah. We, we generalize. Okay, well, I, think that's, I think that's ridiculous. We, we, no, no, it's not, no, it doesn't matter what you think. The, well, the, it kind of does. We, we generalize from smaller samples to bigger samples. That's part of what we do and what's done in epidemiology. Now, the CDC holds all the data. Now, importantly, Pfizer has data too. So Pfizer mm -hmm. was responsible for 90 days of data after release of their vaccine. Okay, 90 days. So this is a this is a regulatory dossier. And you know what Pfizer did after 90 days? What did they do? Nothing. Mm -hmm. They didn't release the information. This was I wish you got, let me be very clear, and we'll agree on this. I wish you got all the information and everything was completely transparent for you, doctor. I'm with you on that 150%. The only point I'm trying to make here is you are making the claim, at least it sounds like to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that of the 550,000 people that have died that have been vaccinated, you're making an assertion because you did a study of 300 people, which I would love to read, that all those people or the majority of them must have died from getting vaccinated. And I find that to be a gross assumption. Now, Pfizer, Pfizer did not release their 90-day data. And they under court, they were under court order forced to release the data after the, after the FDA did not want them to release the data. And within I 90 understand. days, Pfizer had 1,223 deaths mm -hmm. where people like me, doctors, patients, and others called Pfizer and said the vaccine just caused a death in a person who just- Doctor, I get it. I get what you're saying. I'm with so, you. So I want a that's a large number of deaths. I, I get within it. Within 90 days. I get now, it. I'm now with there you. Are, there are, there are 4,000 4, peer-reviewed papers in the literature describing fatal and non-fatal vaccine injury syndromes. I'm the senior author on a recent one on myocarditis. And in that paper, we summarize reports, case series of reports uh, right. uh, uh, in the peer-reviewed literature. And there is a fatality rate to myocarditis. It's somewhere between two and five percent. So these are large numbers for a vaccine that never reduced death, that never reduced hospitalization, but yet offered an opportunity for someone to die after taking the shot. Uh, again, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, I just uh, respectfully disagree with you when you say that the vaccines didn't save lives or more people died from the vaccines. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the White Coat Summit? W did you agree with those doctors uh, that in the White Coat Summit that 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 uh, did that press conference? Because that was somewhat controversial. I always wanted to ask you your opinions on that. 
what, what, what statement are you talking about? Uh, Dr. Stella Emanuel and many others that talks about hyd hydroxychloroquine and, uh, and other drugs. Uh, these were doctors that many people gave credibility to. Dr. Stella Emanuel specifically uh, talked about demon sperm. She talked uh, you know, about how women could get pregnant in their sleep. And there were a lot of people that gave these doctors um, credibility. In fact, uh, it was Dr. Nick Sawyer, uh, the group's founder, who said they were anti-mass, they were anti-lockdown, they wanted everybody to believe that it was a safe to continue life as normal. It was anti all the public health measures that had been put out as guidance to help prevent the transmission of this uh, this uh, virus. Do you uh, agree with Dr. Uh, Stella Emanuel, or do you take the side of Dr. Nick Sawyer on that? Yeah, I haven't read. I haven't reviewed either one. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you though, regarding masks, the uh, public masking was carefully analyzed in the. Cochrane analysis, over 80 studies, public masking didn't have any effect at all. Even our CDC agrees. Our CDC now says the only time to wear a mask is when we're in respiratory isolation, uh, largely so we don't give the patient a secondary staphylococcal yeah. infection. So that's, you know, that handles masks. Yeah. Uh, the lockdowns and social distancing analyses from Johns Hopkins show they were a complete waste of time. They didn't help anything. They didn't certainly cur curtail the pandemic. Uh, what did work was early treatment, early multi-drug treatment, a paper mm -hmm. by Gugliakos and colleagues showed by December of 2020, we had clear and convincing evidence that early multi-drug treatment worked. It wasn't dependent on any single drug, mm -hmm. but drugs in combination and starting impressively with nasal sprays and gargles, and then we worked through the antivirals. So I can tell you broadly, yeah. uh, the public health response in the United States uh, was was wrong across the board. They were wrong on masking, social distancing, and lockdown. They mm -hmm. were wrong on vaccines. They never supported early treatment. And people like you suffered. Well, I mean, I, you know, again, I would agree to disagree on that one. But let me let me ask you this. If that's true, then why did over eight out of 10 doctors and nurses like yourself, since you claim that the vaccines were so dangerous and some people characterize it as poison, why did eight out of 10 doctors and nurses and those in the medical field get vaccinated? Are they all wrong? And you're right. The vast majority of medical institutions had mandates. They had to. Well, if they thought it was poison and they would die, wouldn't they just uh, you know, quit their job or wait? Well, I guess that's my point to you. Why would so many in the medical field take the vaccines? Are, are they all wrong and are you right? I mean, I mean, they, they took the vaccines. Many of them are doing just fine. I mean, wh why would they take it? I guess well, that's my question. Well, many have, many have died, sadly. Uh, Mackis and colleagues have, have kept careful track in Canada where they have very good data. They know who took the vaccine in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they have over 180 dead Canadian doctors. This has been reported to the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians there. This is an astounding, mainly you know, young people like you uh, uh, mm -hmm. dropping dead after they take the the vaccine. Uh, so, so not I guess, all the doctors. I guess that's where we disagree. That's the biggest disagreement. When I hear people use the term, they drop dead after taking the vaccine. I want actual real evidence that there was a direct correlation between taking the vaccine and dying. And if it's not on their death certificate, people die, as you know, doctor, every day, people die on the basketball court, the playing fields. Sadly, it happens for, and you're a heart doctor. So you know this better than anybody. It could be an enlarged heart. It could be a number of different things, right? And when people say dropped dead, must have died from the vaccine, I just, it's just my personal opinion, and we can disagree on this. I find it extremely irresponsible unless we have direct evidence and we know that they died from the vaccine. If a soccer player drops dead and we know he was vaccinated, soccer players have died in the past, way before the COVID vaccinations, but so many people assume must have died from the vaccine. Do you see where I'm going with that? Does that make sense? We should safely assume it is the vaccine. Remember, we should have a culture of safety, a paper by Holscher and colleagues of those who died of these cardiac deaths, and they have an autopsy, and the autopsy is fairly reviewed by independent reviewers. Yeah, it's 100% mm -hmm. it's due to the vaccine. The case of Oscar Cabrera Adamas, he's the Dominican player. He's playing in Spain. He doesn't want to take the vaccine. Uh, he's forced to take it to play. He takes the vaccine. He has a cardiac arrest on the court, mm -hmm. and he's resuscitated. And then he messages out, I got myocarditis from the vaccine. It caused a cardiac arrest. His family he, said he did not have myocarditis, he, by the he, way. He's try, well, I'm just taking what he says. And then and I'm just telling you what his family said. Uh, he okay, did well, not. His have, family may have been influenced by some powerful uh, okay, well, individuals who do, who don't want the information to come out. That could be then, a conspiracy. Then, then, he's on a medical, then he's on a medical treadmill test and he dies two years later. Listen, I'm a cardiologist. I see these patients in my office every day. Mm -hmm. The vaccine is damaging the heart. 
Uh, this is now abundantly obvious in the peer-reviewed literature. It's causing large numbers of deaths. We should be conservative and assume the vaccine is causing death and investigate as opposed to doing what you're doing. You're assuming it's not the vaccine. No, That's I'm just a proof person. Assumption. No, I'm just an evidence proof based person. And I assume you are as well. And I don't assume anything uh, when it comes to somebody's health. I don't assume just because somebody dies on, on a court or somebody claims they have myocarditis when, by the way, he had no idea whether he had myocarditis or not. He heard from people like you with all due respect, assuming that he had myocarditis. There's no direct medical evidence that he had myocarditis, but yet you're making an assumption and you think it's okay in the medical field to assume that 550,000 people, doctor, have have died from the vaccines when you did a study of 300 people. I find that to be extremely irresponsible on your part. And listen, I'm not the only one that feels that way. As the doctor who I just mentioned, Dr. Nick Sawyer said, you're a Texas cardiologist who promotes ivermectin as part of a multi-drug protocol aimed at early treatment of COVID to outpatients, despite the FDA and the CDC's warning that people should not be taking ivermectin at all for COVID-19 treatment outside of a clinical trial. And I ask you again, why is the CDC wrong? Why is the FDA wrong? Why are 85% of doctors and nurses wrong? Why are they all wrong, but you, not an infectious disease doctor, is right? Well, I'm the most published uh, among all the individuals you it mentioned. It doesn't matter how uh, much you've published, it's, doctor. It's I mean, I'm, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, the publication track record is uh, the, the prima facie evidence of, of having expertise. I've treated thousands of individuals, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine supported by over 300 studies now, ivermectin over 100 studies. The FDA has just retracted all this information uh, on its false claims on ivermectin. Uh, those two drugs were used in McCullough protocol, but so was Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, again, no, no single drug was necessary nor sufficient, but they were needed uh, to treat patients early to prevent hospitalization and death. I'm not alone. The uh, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons strongly backed early treatment from the very beginning. They had the first home treatment guide in October of 2020. Uh, I'm not alone because the World Council for Health globally supported early treatment. We had protocols coming out of Central America. Uh, from Dr. Eugenia Barentio, South Africa, Dr. Chetty, uh, we, Dr. Didier Wienaltz in France. We collaborated all over the world. So no, I'm not alone. Uh, the medical community is mixed on this. There, there is a contingent of doctors who will side with you and say, you know what? We should never have treated COVID. We should have let everybody come in the hospital who got sick. Some will die in the hospital and we should have waited for a vaccine. There will be doctors who side with you but I respectfully disagree. I wanted to treat patients early. Hospitalization is a bad outcome, as you can attest, and it was avoidable with early treatment. I don't think there's anything wrong with respectfully disagreeing. My problem is, is people that make money off of this, these people that sell books, these people that make all these national media appearances on right-wing outlets that try to make a name for themselves and grow their social media and try to make money off of COVID. Now, that could be a, a whole host of different people. I don't like that. I respect the people on the front lines. And I know that you, you've you been doing this for a very long time and you've treated a lot of patients and I appreciate you, you doing that. But I think you get my point where there are a lot of people out there with no medical credentials. There are a lot of people that have huge platforms that say things that are just not true. And all I'm coming from is the point of, I want evidence. I want proof. I don't want a study of 300 people and assume that 550,000 people have died because they were vaccinated. I don't want to take the word of an athlete that there's no evidence that he had myocarditis, but because he said he did and he was vaccinated, we, we all should assume that he died from the vaccination. I just find that dangerous, doctor. I know we're going to uh, agree to disagree on that. But yeah. I just, well, I just right. the reason why you're dangerous is you're not telling me why they died. We, we have 150 people before COVID per year who would die after a vaccine. You know, rare mm -hmm. allergic reaction can happen. Sure. And now we've got 18,655. Uh, uh, because half the world no, took the vaccine. No, 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 no. Listen, th this is the United States. Y listen, half the country takes a flu shot. We don't have 18,000 deaths after a flu shot. It, you know, where do you have a culture of safety? Unless you can tell me what 18,000 Americans die of, unless you have some evidence they died of something else, we safely assume they're de they're dying due to the vaccine, and we get the vaccine off the market. I don't know if that, would you consider that a safe assumption? Yes, yes, we have to be safe. The, yeah, when, when there's new a new drug, this is the genetic code 
for the lethal part of the virus with no ability to turn off the genetic code once it's generating the body. It's a dangerous mechanism of action. We should assume a, a, that it's the vaccine. We have a conservative, uh, um, we have a, a culture of, of, of safety. I chaired data safety monitoring boards in my career. And I can tell you, the FDA told me specifically, listen, McCullough, someone dies after taking this. You assume it's new to the new drug. You don't assume it's not especially when the drug and this vaccine has a dangerous mechanism of action, we should assume it's due to the vaccine. That's being safe and conservative. Okay. Well, again, I, I would just go to their death certificate. I would go to their medical professionals that knew their medical history. I think that's more important than anything. I am not going to sit here and say that nobody's died from the COVID vaccines. Of course, there are people that have died. As you know, there's negative effects to every vaccine. There's always going to be a risk. And I agree with you on that, doctor. Again, we're going in circles. All I simply say is, Look at all the people that took the COVID vaccinations compared to the flu shot. Look at all the people that have had complications from COVID, people that still have long COVID, people that I know personally. I'm not the same person I was before I had COVID. And then I look at their medical history, as I'm sure you would, and to make an assumption that 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 because someone took the vaccine and died, they must have died from the vaccine. I want someone doing an autopsy. I want mm -hmm. somebody that knows their medical history. I want yeah. somebody that knows all the circumstances around their death. I agree with you, doctor. It's unfortunate if you're not getting all the information from the CDC, from a Pfizer, I'm with you 150%. Investigate it. Let's get all the information. But with that being said, I'm not going to sit here and say 550,000 people died because they were vaccinated either, because I think that's a gross mischaracterization. Well, it could be as much as 550,000. It could be more. It could be less. But the point is, it's a very large number. We should never be talking about large numbers of deaths after a vaccine. We should never have this conversation. You know, 150 for everybody who takes a flu shot, every kid who takes a childhood vaccine schedule, mm -hmm. that's a massive number of injections. Well, but I know you I know you didn't agree with all the closures. This will be, you know, I know you got to run, doctor. Uh, last question for you, and I appreciate your time, by the way. Um, during COVID, when we had four to 5,000 deaths a day, right, the peak of COVID deaths, you would have been okay with 60,000 people in a stadium watching a football game unvaccinated. You would have been okay with nobody wearing masks, nobody vaccinated, none of that stuff, everybody living their life normally. And you would have been totally okay with that. At that time, we were losing four to 5,000 people a day. You wouldn't have wanted any type of parameters at all during that time. Well, sick people shouldn't be going to the stadium. They should of be course. getting early treatment. Of course. R recall that most of the deaths, a large fraction came from nursing homes, congregate living facilities. They weren't in football stadiums uh, like you. But people could um, catch the virus and then go home and give it to other people. It would help spread the virus. You would agree with that, right? Well, listen, we all got it. 97 point, you know, probably 99% of Americans got it. Yeah. So it was ridiculous, this idea that you weren't going to get it. We were all going to get it. It was about getting early treatment. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. You know, it turns out the, the the single greatest intervention that could reduce spread was virucidal and static nasal sprays and gargles, believe mm -hmm. it or not. So mm -hmm. everybody should have probably been using a nasal spray and gargle mm -hmm. after coming home from the football stadium. But yeah, yeah, keep the football stadiums open. The Great Barrington Declaration was correct. We should have protected the seniors, high-risk people in congregate living facilities. So the pandemic response was wrong. Shutting down the football stadiums was wrong. Shutting down the schools was wrong. And we should have taken a much different approach. Well, doctor, I'll say this. It's an important debate. It's an important conversation. You're certainly not afraid to have these type of debates. And I respect you for that. I really do. Perhaps down the road, we could have another conversation. It certainly is a good one. We hope we never get back to the days where, uh, you know, there, this pandemic was a terrible one. And sadly, I know you, I'm sure you know a lot of people that lost their lives, as do I. It's tragic. It's terrible. And uh, I appreciate the conversation, doctor. And I really do appreciate your time. And I appreciate you coming on this show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's Dr. Peter McCullough, everybody. Obviously, we disagree on a lot of things, um, and we're going to discuss that when we come back, but I do appreciate him taking the time to come on the show and to talk about it. Oh, boy, I'm sure we have a lot of people fired up that want to talk about this. So we 